audience and see my actions and comments and I can see the body language and I can't see any of you except for what you're wearing. I don't know what you're writing. Um, but anyhow, welcome to the workshop writing goals and objectives for the difference. Um, I've offered this workshop a couple times before, uh, and I think it's really crucial that all of you who teach or train um, understand the difference between goals and objectives. Um, the workshop will consist mostly of writing objectives, which is primarily the, the focus of the workshop, but I hope to begin with uh, information about goals, uh, and then we'll work right into objectives. But briefly, I would like to have you introduce yourself. Now, the people who are in Line will only be able to type their information. And Stephanie can read it back to me. We can get to know who we are here. And she will just give us your name, your department, or your unit. And then why you have decided to attend today's workshop. So we'll start with our uh, two members who are in the audience in the uh, building here today. And we'll start with Josephine. Hi. Uh, my name is Josephine Burke. With the Art Museum, and I'm going to be teaching introduction to museum studies this fall for the second time. And I don't know what the difference between goals and objectives. <laughs> Great. <laughs> this is not terminology I'm used to. Okay. Um, this is the new kind of speak that states after I went to school, and those were not the type of things that people put out when I was. So I have no mentors to follow on this. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Dan Cabrera, a multimedia coordinator. I'm, I'm really excited to be part of, uh, this, uh, to attend this workshop because I think that topic is, is critical for in any field, anything to instruct, make that uh, differentiation. And I believe there is a, a clear differentiation. So I'm, uh, I'm happy that Dan and Stephen are here to. Establish that. Thank you. I'm Stephanie Richter. We're still waiting on a few instructions here in the tech test, but my name is Stephanie. I'm the Instructional Technologies Coordinator, and I'm facilitating all of the online work today. This is, as Janet has said before, the first time we've tried to do this, and we can tell there are a few growing pains here, but bear with us and feel free to let me know if there's any problems. Do we have introductions with the typing? No introductions online with that shy group. Okay. All right. Well, we'll start with the uh, workshop. And if you again have any questions or concerns, uh, raise your hand virtually or physically, and then uh, we'll be able to answer the questions for you. So I have a question for you, though, to start off with. Why care about goals and objectives? And um, if you can type your answer, um, Stephanie could probably read it back to me, but um, between Dan and Josephine here, you know, why should we even care about both subjects? I'll let, I'll let Dan start because he knows a little bit more about the difference between the two, and then Josephine can chime in. Well, you, you need to have a direction for your instruction, uh, whether that's for the entire semester or um, or just a, a session, one class session. Um, and the the goals are. You know, the sort of the broad direction you want to end up, but how to get there uh, is, is probably more important. So, so how you break that down, I think that's that's why you need to make that distinction and objective or simply those steps to get you the goal. Can you talk about, uh, okay, that was the first definition I needed. <laughs> Why would you care about goals and objectives or even the difference between the two? I think it's important for students to have some sense of where the course is going. And that's what goals and objectives, I think, can, can do. A goal gives them sort of that, that big picture, why am I even here? And objectives can tell them exactly what they're going to get out of being here. All right. Any responses online? Yes. I do. Okay. Can you take me um, the slide that you're seeing here just gives you some real basic information about why I care about goals and objectives. Goals, as you will see, provide kind of an overarching intent of instruction. Um, in essence, it's kind of a fuzzy description or a fuzzy statement. 
but as you'll see as we go through the slides and we talk here, <clears throat> the, the goal will set an overarching expectation. So think about the courses that you teach and most likely on the syllabi that you have, if on the front page or so or somewhere near the front of the syllabus, we have a list of those goals and or objectives. And hopefully by the end of today's workshop, we'll be able to go back to those goals and objectives and identify which is which and maybe look at the objectives and say, you know what, they aren't explicit enough to be called um, objectives. I've actually reviewed a syllabus of a faculty member on campus here, and she showed me her syllabus that had, I think, 25 objectives. And really, many of them were just basic goals, and you'll see the difference as we move forward. But then on the other side of the slide here, we look at objectives. What's nice about an objective is that if they're properly written, the students understand what they do, and when you come to assess their work, it will help for your students to achieve consistent results and then help you then to assess them. Um, you will see that objectives tend to be measurable and observable, especially these behavioral types of uh, objectives, and when they are written in such a way that we can ensure that those results are <coughs> me, truly measurable or observable. We can actually see what the student is actually doing. And objectives also, when properly written, will allow the student to know exactly where to start and where to end. It will guide their efforts throughout the semester and throughout the section of the section. For those who are here, I apologize again. If you speak up just a little bit to make sure that my son gets you. <coughs> sure. It won't pick us up as well, but that's not as important. Just a moment while we shuffle the audio to fit. It'll be a little closer. Okay. Can you hear me a little bit better now that the microphone is closer to the station? Definitely. Raise your hand. Much better. All right. And I will talk a little louder, too. Okay. On this particular slide here, you will see two columns. And this slide really tells you or shows you the difference between what a goal is and what an objective is. Goals tend to be broad, generalized statements. So think about what you teach and what you want your students to learn. And some of those types of statements are broad and generalized. Goals tend to be long-term. They kind of um, go along with the, the class from semester to semester, whereas objectives can change depending on maybe where your students are. I'm not going to read through each of these points, but you'll see that the differences between, they're almost kind of opposite of one another, even though they do support one another. Um, so goals provide the general intentions of your instruction. Um, they tend not to be tangible. You really can't see them, you can't observe when a student is doing a goal, whereas you can see when a student is doing an objective. Goals are more abstract in their uh, development, in their structure, whereas objectives are more concrete. Now, the, the second to the last point here on the goals um, column, when you do true instructional design, we often do a series of steps where we analyze our learners and, and analyze the need for instruction. So goals tend to be what you really are intending and want to do. That's why we say it's, they are usually defined before you do an analysis. <clears throat> but then goals are obviously written before objectives because objectives really are a subset um, or a portion of a, a goal. And on the right side, you can see where the objectives tend to be short-term because they can be specific to a particular subject, particular content area, um, particular group of students, and, and so on. Okay. So when you set forth your um, desire to write a goal, think about your class, what you want your students to do, and then start to just write down everything you think that you want your students to learn. And you can do that by just brainstorming. Get a piece of paper out, use your computer, and just start brainstorming what you want your students to learn, what you want your students to do. And as the point here says, think big, brainstorm. You know, get all the, the, the things that you want students to learn, what you want them to do, out on paper. And then you can start to 
chunk them by category or area. Um, the second point here talks about uh, relating your course to others and that where you can actually find goals. You can look at prerequisite material to see what students have brought into the class and a goal can come from that. And the third point here is something we'll talk about a little bit later, but you do want to be able to identify your content from your non-content goal. And that might not make any sense, but I'll explain that right now. You have content that you want your students to learn, you have basic topics related to the discipline, to, to the subject matter. Okay, that's kind of a given. But also as an instructor, you want your students to be good writers, you want them to have good study habits, you want them to be able to come to class on time to be able to carry on um, a nice dialogue with their classmates. Those would be called non-content goals. And it's actually good to include those non-content goals on your syllabi or somewhere where your students know that you expect them to be effective students and to be able to write well, to be able to uh, test well, hopefully, and to be able to carry on conversations with one another. So that's the difference between content goals, which is re are related to your uh, discipline and subject area, and non-content non-content goals tend to be the ones that are not specific to the content but will help students succeed in the class. So once you then get that list of um, things you want your students to learn, then you can separate those out uh, and chunk them by area. So this slide gives you um, several examples of what you would consider to be goals. So if you want your students to be able to have perspective on civil rights, that will improve over a period of time, 16-week period, that would be more of an over, overarching goal. Because when you look at that, if I had asked my students to be able to, what is their perspective on civil rights and how will it improve, what will the student do to prove that that perspective has improved? There's nothing in that statement that tells the student what to do. If you teach a math class, um, Stephanie is a math major, so she could understand this. If you want your students to learn basic basic math skills, you can see that that's an overarching goal because it doesn't tell students which skills you want them to learn, other than basic. But basic to an instructor, a basic um, skill to a, an instructor would be quite different perspective than, say, a basic skill for a student. Um, the second to the last one is really important because I wanted to use the word understand. Often faculty use the words understand or know in their objectives, and those terms are actually too fuzzy because they can't be measured. I mean, how do you measure someone's understanding of something? And I know that this gets to be a sticky point with a lot of faculty on campus because if they look at their course goal or objectives on their syllabi, many of them have words like knowing and understanding. And if they cannot be measured, they cannot be then considered as an objective. But definitely they can be used as a goal. Okay, so you can see those are very you know, fuzzy types of terms. They, they, they tell the students something, but not enough for them to actually do it. Okay, so that's really it related to goals. Even though I'll come back to goals as we go through objectives, but objectives are much more, um, what I'm considering really more important because the objectives will tell your students what they have to do in order to succeed in your class. Okay. So instructional objectives related to whatever outcomes that you want your students to do. And we'll see that as we go through um, the rest of this workshop. Objectives are very specific. They're measurable. They should be written for the students. And this is, again, where some people get hung up. Often a faculty member will write an objective based on what they want rather than what the students should be doing. Um, this last point is really important because this is what an objective does. It informs the students what to do. It tells them what to do. It lets your students know exactly what you want them to do by the end of the unit, by the end of the midterm, by the end of the entire semester. Depending on what book you read, what research that you've been reading about objectives, they will um, define 
objectives differently, but in general, there are three major characteristics of an objective. There's a condition, and that's what kind of a given what the students would have or have not before they actually attempt to do the objective. There's a performance, and then there is either what they call a criterion, or it could be more than one, it could be criteria, and then some sort of a degree. Criterion degree, depending on what book you read, are really one and the same. And then we'll define each of these as we go along now. Okay, conditions. This is something that actually influences the shape of the student's performance. So when you write an objective, it has to have all these three characteristics. Um, often, objectives begin when they're written. They begin with the condition. They're not always at the very beginning of the written objective, but many times um, the condition is at the beginning of, of the uh, actual objective. They must affect the student's performance. So a condition is sometimes called a given. So what would the students have to be able to do the performance? Can they use a book? Do they need prior knowledge? Do have they um, pass a specific test? Uh, can they use a calculator and those types of things? And we'll work on these examples um, in a minute here. So you ask the question, what would it take to make performance possible? What does the student need in order to make the performance possible? So ask, what with or with what and to what? All right. So for example, these are conditions. Depending on the objective, a student could use another person. It could be a device. It could be a computer. It could be a hammer. It could be a mouse in their hand. A mouse. This kind of mouse. <laughs> Um, a pen or a pencil, um, a job aid, a set of instructions, something to go along with. Or think about most of you probably have had, at least have a, had a master's degree, and when you went to take your GRE, did you take a calculator with you when you took the GRE to do with the math component? No. So in essence, that would be a condition. The condition states what they can or cannot use in order to do the performance. So here are some statements or examples, kind of what I would call a stem that you would find at the beginning of an objective. So using the electronic discussion board, the students will, and then you can fill in the rest based on what you want the student to do. Um, given three sample statements, or using PowerPoint, or you could say using a um, lawnmower, or using a keyboard with your team members. Now, throughout the slides, you're going to see some text at the bottom of these examples in red. And you can either write that, put that statement down, or you can just remember it in your head. But the red text will be shown as a final example at the very end of the, the section that we're going to be going through here. So given a standard balance beam raised to a standard height, that is going to be the beginning of the very end uh, long, actually, the objective that you'll see uh, toward the end of the, this section of the, the PowerPoint presentation. So you can see by these examples, these are stems, and you can fill in your own information, but this should help you kind of at least begin to formulate what type of conditions that you might want to include based on what you want your students to actually do. Okay, performance. This is um, another characteristic of a well-written uh, objective. This is the doing term. This describes what the student actually has to do or is expected to do. They tend to be visible or audible, something that we can hear, something that we can see or watch the students do. That's why it's measurable. If the performance is less than visible or covert, we can add what we call an indicator behavior. <clears throat> and you'll see this with the worksheet that we'll work on a little bit later. Those indicator behaviors then will help further clarify what the students actually have to do. So if you have the students identify something, let's say a map, and you've got a map on the wall and you want your students to identify the capitals of all the states on the eastern seaboard. 
And what would the student do, though, to identify it? Would they point to it? Would they underline it? Would they identify it by saying the capital state? So you can see that your terms need to be very concrete and less fuzzy. So if it is a what I would consider a covert performance, just add some sort of an indicator behavior to let the students know exactly what they have to do. Keep in mind that many of you have been teaching for years and years, and you know exactly what you want your students to do. But each of your students every semester is new. They might not be able to read your mind. So be very specific in writing out your objectives, and then there won't be any issues where your students say, well, you didn't tell me that we had to do it that way. So ask yourself, what is the doing word? What is the verb that is going to tell the students what they actually have to do? What is the intended action? So here is a list of examples of performance. You know, assemble the microscope. Name the three branches of the United States government. Label all the bones in the human hand. You know, solve the problem. <coughs> All of these are beginning with verbs that are doing terms so the student knows exactly what they have to do. I mean, you could say break the microscope. That would be another <coughs> observable performance, but it wouldn't be logical, obviously, in a learning situation unless you wanted the student to actually break the microscope. So the red text in this one happens to be, pardon me, <coughs> walk the entire length of the balance. Remember, we go back to given a standard balance beam raised to a standard height. That's the given. The next part is walk the entire length of the balance beam. So you have a theme going on here. OK, the third characteristic or component of a well-written objective would be the criterion or degree. Again, those two words are used interchangeably. This is something that tells the student how much performance is actually required, how well you know, what, at what level do they have to meet in order to be able to be being successful in completing the objective? How well the learner must be able to perform the task. When you write your objectives, you really want to relate them to real world tasks, to tasks that the students are actually going to be doing when they leave you, when they leave the university and they go out in the work world. You want your students to be able to do these real things. So write your objectives that match real-world expectations and tasks. So these criteria or degrees say something about the quality of the performance and can definitely be based on standards. And many disciplines on campus have some sort of standards that um, kind of help focus the, the curriculum so the students of the program meets those particular standards. Okay. The criterion or degree, um, this is from a text that talks about the yardstick by which accomplishment of objectives will be measured. Yeah, so think about what you want your students to do and how well do you want them to do it to be able to actually be considered successful at that objective. Now, if it would be 50% of the time or if they got half of the balls in the box, would they need to get 100 of the balls in the box to be successful? You, know, you have to be kind of realistic about what you want your students to do. Often the criteria degrees have numerical values, but not always. So we'll show you some examples of that. And people write very good objectives, but many of them fail to put in this last component. You know, they, they say, why state a criteria? Or why state criterion? Because as this first statement says here, it's a standard against which to test the success of instruction. Students will know exactly how well they have to do in order to be considered that they successfully completed that objective or performed the way you want them to perform. Okay. So within the criterion or degree area of the objectives, there are three general subcategories: time and speed accuracy, and quality. Okay. So when we talk about time and speed, this should actually help clarify more what a criteria, uh, criterion actually is. 
you know, describe the time or speed limit. Think about you when you give your students an exam. During final exam week, they have an extended period of time to take an exam. What if the student wanted to go past the, what is it, an hour and 15 minutes? Okay. Probably not, right? They've got this amount of time and then that's the way it is. So you could say within 15 minutes or within a month um, or at the speed of light. And I put that in there because of that last point was the exclamation point. Be reasonable in your expectations and how you write your objectives when it comes to the criteria that you, you include. If you have a 300 question final exam, essay exam, the 300 questions, I'm being very facetious here, would a student be able to complete it in an hour and 50 minutes during the final exam schedule time? Probably not. They probably wouldn't even be able to do 150, well, maybe, um, fill in the blanks or true and false. 300 might be a lot. So be reasonable when you actually write your objectives so the students can actually do it. Don't expect them to do something that they don't know really how to do. You're not trying to trick your students into performance. You want to be able to have them use what they've learned throughout the semester to be able to perform the way that they should. Okay. Under the accuracy category of criteria, um, must refer to the performance. Again, everything has to kind of go back to the performance. Even the condition must be related to the performance and the objective. So must refer to the performance and describe the proficiency of that performance. So, within five micrometers. Now, that would be a very important criterion, especially if someone is learning how to do surgery, let's say brain surgery. You want to make sure that the person who is learning how to do brain surgery is able to make those cuts and those movements within that brain within micrometers and not more than what they would have to. Otherwise, you could actually injure a person. You know, to the farthest target. Um, with all the seams no larger than a quarter of an inch, it goes back to my textile degree years and years ago, um, something cut at a 90 degree angle, what if someone cut something at a 45 degree angle? Would they have met your objective? Most likely not because they didn't meet that particular accuracy criterion. And there's the red text without falling off and that will again become clear when we get to that last slide. So finally we have the quality criterion section or category and describes only the criteria important. It actually should, that should be too wide performance that is expected after um, instruction. And often the quality criterion area deals with qualitative standards rather than quantitative standards. So the quantitative standards would fit more within the accuracy, whereas quality deals more with the qualitative type of expectations for your students. So, here's an example of a quality criterion. The information is pertinent to the question. Uh, new words are defined when first introduced. Students are treated courteously. They are not insulted or demeaned. You know, that would be something that you could help train faculty for or student teachers or whatever. Okay. And a quality criterion you'll see in the red text from one end to the other, other steadily. It's somewhat measurable, but it's more observable, so it'll be more quality related. So you want to ask certain questions when you are beginning to write your objective. And the first one is, what do you want your students to do? And that should be the primary question. And when you then answer your, the question, you write it down, then you can start to break it apart into certain components and then put together a really well-written objective. So the first point right there is what you want your students to do. That would be related to the performance. What is the doing thing? What is going to be observable or measurable? Then, you know, what are the conditions or constraints under which the student actually does the performance? What are the holdbacks? What are the givens? What can they use? What can't they use? And then that last point, and how well does the student actually have to do that performance in order for you to say, my students got it, or they understand it, or they were able to do it. And that deals then with your criterion 
or your degree. Okay, so here's our goal. You're in a phys ed class. It didn't have any adult uh, clip art images, and that's all I had, but it works nonetheless. So you want your students to okay, walk the length of the balance beam. So your students get up there in the street shoes because shoes are much more sturdy and you can kind of grab onto that, that, that beam and they walk across the balance beam not too steadily. They fall a little bit but then they get back up. Okay. That's what the student could do. If you wanted them to walk the length of the balance beam, the student could do it any way that they wanted. They could go backwards if, if they wanted. They could do flips along the way if they wanted. So you can see that the goal is kind of fuzzy. It doesn't give the student any more explanation on what to do. This is the objective. And this relates to the red text that we had earlier. Given a standard balance beam raised to a standard height, the student dressed in standard balance beam attire will be able to walk the entire length of the balance beam from one end to the other steadily without falling off and within a six second time span, time period. And you're going to go, what the heck? I can't write objectives like this. And you actually can. And you're going to see it has a performance, it has a condition, and it has a criteria. Actually, more than one criteria. So, one thing to keep in mind, too, is that when you write your objective, they don't have to be long sentences because it's very difficult to make a long sentence like this to make sense to your students. You can list the performance in a sentence and then you could actually, or you could write the, write the performance in more of a sentence structure and then you could list the conditions underneath it and you could list the uh, degree or the criteria underneath it in like a bullet list. Okay, so the condition is given a standard balance beam and so on. And this is what I'd like you to do is think about this. When you look at your objectives that you have on your syllabi or in your books that you use, write them out and start to break them apart and see if they really do indeed have all three components of a well-written objective. There's the performance, and then there is the criterion or degree. Now, as I said, you do not have to have the um, objective written off written as one complete sentence. This one does make sense, but again, you can see if you chunk it out, you can kind of pull them out and then have them um, listed in, in different locations. And then notice that this objective does begin with the condition. Performance tends to be in the middle, and then the criteria tend to be toward the end. That's kind of typical of uh, objectives, but they don't always have to be in that format. Okay, so here's a question. So for those who haven't typed anything yet that are online, I want you to read this and type out, so Stephanie can look at them, what is the condition in this objective that you see here? And Josephine, I'm going to ask you, what do you think the condition is this objective? Okay. Right. Think of the condition. What is, what is the given? Okay, hold on, hold that thought. Okay. What do we have? We have, we have two, three, four responses actually. Oh my, you got them all going. Uh, and everyone responded, give a, give a patient of any weight. Okay. Dan, do you agree? Okay. All right. Now, the examples I'm showing you, most of them do begin with a condition, but again, they're not always written that way. But the condition is given a patient of any weight. So you can see that's a condition because it's kind of like it's just a given, all right? It tells you what, what is there to help you actually perform the, the doing thing. And the doing thing, well, here, this is an example then, condition, given the patient of any weight. So very good for those who wrote in on the line. So what is the performance of the same objective? Yeah. Be able to start an IV. Sometimes you will see Objectives that will include the word the student will be able to. You don't have to include the students. But if you had, let's say, 
students mixed in with faculty mixed in with different people and you have them all doing the same thing, maybe you want them to do something different, then you might want to specify students versus, or boys versus girls, or men versus women, or whatever that might be. But often you will say, be able to. So start an ID. Very good. That's what that is. Okay. So what's the criterion? What shows that they've actually done it well enough to prove that they can actually do the start an IV? Are you all holding your arm? It's really hurt. Anyone? Do they write it down? What is the criterion? No more than two. No more than two. I would say no more than one to be successful. I would like no more than one. <laughs> I would like no more than any. But okay. So we're going to practice a little bit more here. Here's another objective, and I want you to read it, and then to ask yourself, what is the performance? And then type that in the chat area. Josephine, Dan? Well, what is the doing thing here? What is the student actually doing, or what is the performance? Okay, yes? Do we all agree? Present? Oral presentation or dramatic presentation. Okay. Notice it's beginning with a verb, a doing word. Okay, so same um, objective. What is the condition then? Okay. In the classroom, using previously prepared materials. So we have two conditions. In the classroom is one, and using previously prepared materials is another. Okay. So then finally, what is the uh, criterion or degree by which you're going to measure a student's success? Actually, there's more than what you see here. I didn't select all of it. Because demonstrating the mathematics concept groups of five, that really would also be a condition or a um, criterion, because it's kind of like a standard. And hopefully the students have learned that. So looking at that slide, it really should be. There's your degree or your criterion. Okay, here's another. What's the performance? Merge. Okay, good. Josephine immediately used the word merge. So when you're looking for performances in an objective, or if you're writing a performance, Think of a verb to begin that performance, and that will help you then finish the rest of it. Okay, so merge a Word document with the Access database. Okay. The condition. Give it an access database. Right, give it an access database file or customer name. Now, all conditions don't begin with the word given, but sometimes they are. And then the criterion or degree. Yeah. So that each customer will receive a personalized letter. Okay, let's do one more. The performance. How are our virtual people? Good? Yeah. Write a paragraph. Um, this would be really a good, you could use this really as a content or a non-content objective even, because, you know, you want your students to do research papers or data or collect data, but you want them to be able to write well with clear topics, sentences, supporting details, and concluding sentences. That, that could really almost be a non-content objective in your class um, if you are not teaching a specific topic. Okay, the condition then would be? 
given specific set of, yeah, right. And then the criterion or degree. Right. Clear topic sentence. Supporting details, three supporting details, and a concluding sentence. So you can see with the examples that we've just gone over, each of them has the three components. By writing a clear objective like this, giving them to your students, there will be no questions from your students on what they have to do. And it also helps you become more um, objective in your assessment of your students' performances as well. So we're going to run through this quickly here. Okay. So we're going to do this a practice in a minute. <clears throat> but in general, goals tend to be broad statements of intent. So go back to your syllabi, go back to your books that you use for beginning your classes in the fall, and look to see what those overarching goals are. Ask yourself, what do you want your students to learn in the class? Start brainstorming, list them, and then they can be kind of fuzzy statements. Objectives help to achieve consistent results. If they're well written, there may be no questions on what the students have to do, now, whether they all can perform, it's you know, equally is another thing. So all students learn a little bit differently. They all have different skill sets. Some are more confident than others. Um, but objectives are measurable, and they help guide students do what they should do. Ask yourself what conditions or constraints the students will need in order to do or perform the objective. And then finally, you know, how well must they perform for you to be satisfied? That's related then to your degree or your criteria. Whoops, I missed my, missed my slide here. Well, there's a, there's a practice slide coming up, but it, I think it's disappeared. Okay, anyhow. Stephanie emailed all of you a worksheet. Face-to-face <laughs> -face people get handouts in person. So what I would like you to do is Look at this handout that I've given you, and then I'll, I'm also projecting it here online. Well, they can't see this? Okay, sorry. Sorry, you can't see this, but actually, they can't see this. It might not be terribly clear, but we'll get this. Okay. Okay. So, Stephanie's aligned the camera to the screen. And on the worksheet, you're going to see three columns. Each of the columns represents one of those characteristics of a well-written objective. Condition column is the first one, performance is the middle, and criterion and degree is on the last, the third column. I have filled in one of them for you. So you're going to see this objective begins with a condition, given an unmarked map outlining each of the 50 United States. And then I put in parentheses the student will be able to do. And I think it's important to include that statement because then the student knows the objective is written for them rather than for the instructor. The middle column then is the performance. Notice it begins with a verb, identify, representing states won by the Democratic Party and those won by the Republican Party. Notice right after the word identify is another word in parentheses, color. Because identify, even though it's a verb, it's a little bit fuzzy because it doesn't really specifically say what the student has to do. So in this case, you want them to color those states. The unmarked map doesn't have anything on it, but just the outline of the state. So then the students would color. Now, another condition could be using the paint or the crayons or the color.
watercolor markers or using the software or whatever to fill in the, those blanks. So the identify word has a, a um, indicator behavior to further direct students And then the third column represents the degree or the criteria. And in this case, according to those states designated blue, and those states designated red, of the 2008 U.S. presidential election. Okay. Now, you could give your students that objective. And the given could be something that is available online or that you hand it out to them. But the criterion or degree, the student would most likely be responsible for finding that information. So it could be in a book, it could be online, whatever. So with the rest of these um, blank areas for all three of these uh, characteristics, take a little bit of time and see if you can fill in or create an objective using the actual performance terms or verbs that are listed down the middle of the, of the column. Now, Stephanie did not send this to you, but we'll send it to you anyway. There, online, there are, you can do a Google search and you can find a list of verbs related to objectives. This is actually called the helpful hundred that comes from the textbook that's listed at the bottom of the sheet. But there are many hundreds types of verbs that you could use. And some of the verbs are uh, even subdivided into different types of objectives, such as the um, behavioral objectives versus affective objectives versus kinesthetic type of objectives. So at least this list gives you um, somewhere to start. So when you start working with writing your objectives, get a list like this, keep it next to you. You can use this list then to um, help write your objectives. Let me go back to the sheet. Let's, let's work on one together here. Does anybody have a particular verb they want to work with? Anybody virtually have a word they'd like to work with and we can all work together in developing an objective? Anything being typed? Uh, Susan Anderson asked for evaluate. Evaluate. Right. Okay. All right. Susan, what subject do you teach? We'll, we'll, look, we'll look at the roster here. Uh, she's a nurse in the health study, health nurse. assessment to this. Okay, health assessment. All right, so that's why I evaluate. Okay. Do you have, Susan, an objective right now that uses the word evaluate as far as a verb for your students to do? question. <laughs> you get the clock ticking away. Susan, you there? Great. Um, it's not fully developed, but they need to evaluate normal and abnormal love styles. Long sounds? Long sounds, yes. Okay. Um, what kind of condition would you want to include to help build this objective? Even an adult patient. Okay. And keep in mind too, when you write your objectives, you could have more than one condition. Okay. So given an adult patient, Students will be able to evaluate normal and abnormal lung sounds. So far, so good. All right. What kind of um, criterion or degree do you want to include so the students know that they have successfully performed this objective? And I know you're typing, so. Okay. 
Anybody else or Dan, do you have anything here? Um, oh, you're sure. sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I teach a class on, on semantics, you know, actually semantic classics. And in my school, I think um, one class performance was, would be to get the students to be able to analyze a case study. Okay, Dan is talking about his, a class that he teaches on medical ethics. He wants the students to analyze a case study. Okay, so that's the performance. That would be the performance. The condition would be uh, yeah, uh, given, given a patient. Uh, 
suffering an irreversible culture. I said the only student will be able to now that would be Would, the, would those components of Dan be your degrees or your criteria? Um, okay, yeah. yeah. So, let's see. suffering irreversible coma, students will be able to analyze a case study following actually you don't want the specific framework, but you know, what is this specific though? Can you give a name to this framework? Um, would it be a method? Or actually it's called celibate. Celibate uh, method. Uh, ethical analysis. So it's a it's a it's a it's a acronym. Oh it's an acronym? You don't see Dan here, but I'm watching his body language as he's doing this. And, I, and I'm sure that you all kind of look the same way when you start to build these objectives, that you kind of put your head to your, or your hand to your head and you think a little bit. But this is where it helps you to, to brainstorm lots of information. So, okay, this is Dan's objective. Would all of you be able to execute this objective without any problem based on what you're reading? Given the patient suffering irre irreversible coma, students will be able to analyze a case study following the celibate framework. Pretty clear? Okay. Right. Anybody else? For practice. One thing I would like to call your attention to. I have some resources on the last slide of the PowerPoint presentation. And Robert Mager is kind of like the guru of instructional design. He's been around for ages, and he has a series of books that are extremely useful um, that I have used over the years. If you check out the bookstore at the beginning of the semester, several courses, several faculty actually have their students adopt some of these, but most specifically, is this book right here? Sorry about that. Preparing Instructional Objectives, a critical tool in, in the development of effective instruction. If you're going to buy any book to help you write well-written objectives, this is the one to purchase. They're trade books, so they're fairly inexpensive. I think they're under $20 or, or close to $20. Um, I use mine all the time when I teach. I refer to it all the time as far as making sure that my objectives have a performance, a condition, and a criterion or a degree. But it's a super book to have. It's, you can actually read it in a night. Um, he adds a little humor to make it uh, digestible because of the subject, but it really is not boring at all. 
I'm holding up the book so Josephine can see it and Dan can see it. Um, Stephanie's going to focus the camera. There we go. Can you see it? Yellow book, yellow text, or yellow, yellow book. Um, you order it directly through his company, the Center for Effective Performance, but it's really a, a super resource for anyone who wants to teach um, well enough and have objectives written so your students know exactly what they have to do um, for the performance in class. All right, so without further ado, the camera. I'd like to thank you for our first simulcast. We're ending a little earlier than normal. Um, we probably have a little more discussion going on if we were all face to face, uh, but this is actually a great exercise for all of you who will be integrating blended components to your class and working online with your students. And um, you can see that it's, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to get people to uh, carry on conversations virtually. But um, does anyone have any questions about objectives or goals that they would like to ask? I just wanted to see the comment on the strong relationship between the objective development and the assessment for you as an educator. Oh, definitely. Dan brings up a really great point. All of your objectives that are in your syllabus that you expect of your students need to be tied to assessments and vice versa. All of your assessments need to be tied to objectives. So whatever objective that you have your students do, make sure you include some sort of an assessment that is meaningful in order for your students to actually, for you to actually see that your students have, have um, been able to work out and perform these objectives. Um, any activity that you have your students working on should somehow be tied to your objectives. So if you have objectives in your class, on your syllabus, you look at it and you say, you know what, I never cover these then it might be a time to think about revising those objectives, rewriting them, eliminating them, um, adding, adding new ones that you haven't had before. Really, this is a great time to do it before the fall semester begins, right, the first week of the summer term. Look at your syllabi, very carefully review your goals and objectives, and start to think about them using, you can follow this PowerPoint presentation, you can follow what we've been discussing, you can follow Mayer's book, but it would be a great way to look at your assessments and your objectives and seeing if they tie in. Um, your objectives obviously should be tied into any standards that are driving your curriculum. Um, College of Education obviously is driven by NK. There are other <coughs> entities that uh, kind of drive curricula across campus. Uh, Josephine, do you have some sort of standard or uh, agency that? You know, Okay, Josephine's talking about um, her curriculum might be driven off of the uh, American Association of Museums. So if you're not sure, talk to someone in your department, talk to your chair for sure if there are um, standards that need to be met for your curriculum to be successful and then start to build your course and your objectives um, based on those. Does that answer your question, Nancy? Stephanie, do you have any last minute thoughts? Actually, just something I want to make you talk about. How's that for putting you on the spot? Uh, I think it might be worthwhile to mention the value of sharing them with their students and whether or not students really read or benefit from them. <clears throat> I hope everybody heard that. Stephanie was saying to make sure that you share your objectives with your students and whether your students are actually reading them. One way you can get your students to read the objectives beyond what's on the syllabus is to include in your activities and your assignments and assessments what objectives those activities are actually meeting. So you can just copy and paste them directly from your syllabus into, let's say, the instructions that you have for an activity or the instructions that you have for some assignment. And then talk about it with your students. Um, before you begin, or let your students go with doing an assignment that's due in a couple of weeks to say, you know what, this assignment is actually meeting objective number two on our syllabus and explain why you have included that objective. And why are you wanting your students to do what you're ask, asking them to do? <coughs> so it's a very good point Stephanie makes. Don't
don't hide your objectives for your students. And once they're on your syllabi, <coughs> move them out of the syllabus and put them in with your um, activities and assessments and assignments that your students are going to be doing so they can see the tie-in and the relationship and that you are not just selecting an activity just because you like it or you're not <coughs> having your students do um, an assignment just because you've been doing it for 20 years in teaching but has no tie-in with your um, actual objectives. Josephine, do you feel any clearer now on the difference between goals and objectives? And do you think that you'd be able to write objectives a little more clearly? Josephine is saying that she knows the difference now between a goal and objective, <laughs> and she would need to look at back look back at some of the objectives that she's already written, and they might need to be tweaked a little bit to at least have those three characteristics: condition, a performance, a degree, or a criterion. Dan, I, I just wanted to comment that uh, although this will require someone for everyone, um, the great sense of satisfaction and really clarifying not just your students but with yourself. What it is it you want your students to do? And once it, it, it becomes so huge, then you really can justify uh, using the assessment because there is a direct connection between them, how you, what you assess and how you assess it. I hope all of you heard that. Um, but Dan was just again, reiterating the importance of connecting um, what you expect your students to do in class to the objectives. And objectives really drive your class. Not only does it make it more clear of what the students have to do, but it, it kind of keeps you on task also. So it really is, it's, once you have your objectives written, everything else kind of falls into place. But you can kind of select assessments that match, you can select um, activities that match, um, and showing that connection is really important. Are there any questions from the audience, uh, the virtual audience, Dusty? No, no questions. Well, um, we didn't send them the PowerPoint yet, did we? Okay. We will send you this PowerPoint presentation. And on the, the last slide, it does have the resource to Mager. I mean, I get no money by promoting Mager's book. <laughs> um, but I always promote it anyway, because really, it's just it's one of those kinds of books that everybody should have in their, their teaching library. It's just a wonderful resource. Um, so thank you all for coming. Thank you all for participating in our first simulcast. Um, We'll work out the bug. I apologize for my voice. I take medication that makes my voice scraggly and it's getting scragglier every week. <clears throat> but um, have a great summer. Enjoy the weekend. And we'll see you at another faculty development workshop. Thank you.